Can you see the presentation, John? Uh, not, not now. I did a, a minute ago, second ago. Okay. I can see mine. I can see mine anyway. So. No, well, yeah, but it needs to be mine. Okay, put it back to work. Uh, yeah. Yep, I can see it. Yep. Oh, okay. Right, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the latest in our uh, contemporary group online talks. I'm absolutely delighted that John Ferguson, um, the first black staff photographer in Fleet Street, uh, has agreed to come and talk about his career. Um, and I'm delighted that, uh, that he's with us tonight. So thank you all for joining. I think John's talk is called My Life in Photography and the first couple of slides tell us a lot about him. Um, John's been a professional photographer for over 35 years, spent most of his life predominantly working in press, working from the uh, right from the beginning of her apprenticeship route from being in the darkroom uh, to freelance photographer and then staff photographer on a national paper, a Daily Mirror it was. And uh, John is now an established advertising and commercial photographer specializing in people photography. Uh, he's been fortunate to have worked in nearly 60 countries during his career. Uh, and for someone with a, a curiosity and wanderlust for life, he, he couldn't have found a better occupation for, as he describes himself, a young black kid growing up in North London in the 70s. His camera has truly been his passport for seeing life in so many different levels. Uh, and uh, one of the culminations was uh, his Black Britannia photo exhibition at City Hall in London, when the Prime Minister of the day, John um, Gordon Brown, uh, gave an impassioned speech at the opening of the, of the exhibition. And what I'm going to do is go through some of John's press work to start off with, and he'll comment on the images. Um, in fact, I, I want to say as little as possible, and leave it mostly to you, John. Uh, and we welcome questions. You can put them in on chat, uh, and Sean uh, Goodhart, uh, the, our webmaster, will gather the questions together. But if you've got a question about a particular image, make sure that Sean knows uh, by putting the question in chat. So, John, tell us a bit about some of these images. Well, some of these images are, are typically what I was sent out to do on assignments each day. Um, each night around nine o'clock to 10 o'clock, the night editor will ring each photographer, each staff photographer, and giving them the assignment for the next day. And that assignment might be a two day assignment or a one day assignment or a foreign trip or something, um, or somewhere around the country. Uh, for, so for this job, this in, this picture was taken during um, the Conservative Party. Uh, uh, well, it was, it was a junket, but they were, we were flying around the country, going to different um, towns around the UK to drum up sport for the Tory party. It was a general election. So <laughs> it was a run up to the general election. And we we're on a, a rotor system where we flew from London to Blackpool and Edinburgh, uh, all around the country and then back to London in one day, basically. So it was a whirlwind trip uh, of following Cameron at the time uh, around the UK. And I got some great shots of Cameron because I think there's only about eight of us on the trip um, on the battle bus, as they call it as well. And so it was, uh, I've done it a few, for a few years with Labour and Tories and Liberals as well over the years. So it was always a, a good opportunity to get some great images. 
Um, funny enough, I couldn't find most of them, so but I just felt I found that one and remembered uh, what a great trip that was. Um, so it, the work is very varied. You know, I'm, you know, you, you park up in London waiting for a, a job to turn up or for the editor to call you. And and they all, always do, you know, you, you wait 20 minutes and the phone rings in your car. And and th at this time, it was like, right, John, pack your bags. You're off to New Orleans to do Hurricane Katrina. It's uh, on the way to on the way to uh, New Orleans. You've got to get there before. Uh, so we arrived in Dallas on the day the hurricane hit New Orleans. And you drive over to New Orleans, basically from Dallas, where we flew into and you just go straight into the straight into the action and start working. Um, I, I have a bag. I had two bags already packed in the car. You always have a bag packed in the car, and you always have two passports. When I was a photojournalist for the Mirror, and so you always had your passport in the car, so in case you got sent straight away from wherever you were in London uh, or or the UK. And so yeah, so Hurricane Katrina was a uh, a major. Um, assignment to do and one which was uh, a long one actually two weeks in in New Orleans um, which was great some good some great pictures as well and um, this one was in Afghanistan in Kabul I was sent over with an MP to photograph the conditions in Afghanistan in Kabul in I come in the early 2000s I think this was and I remember this sort of picture. I can't. I remember the, one of the famous photographers taking a picture similar to this. I can't remember this, the, the photographer's name, but it came back to me, and I saw these children from an orphanage, and um, they were right next to this bombed out site. So I just lined them up with this picture, and um, you know, it got used really well. This picture uh, when it got back to London, when I got back to London. This picture was taken in the Horn of Africa in with working with one of the charities. Um, I couldn't find the original, original neg of this image because this is really bleached out the shot, but this was, um, you're traveling miles and miles up into the, the desert parts of uh, Kenya where this Takana tribe live and they were suffering from malnutrition and famine. And we went, went there on the food program and uh, uh, it, it was a, an eye opener to see that part of the world, but uh, I've been there a few times since actually, and it was an interesting assignment to go and do and cover. You get some great images there, and but you have to be so careful how you treat um, your subjects and how you go about taking these pictures. You know, it's um, it's a tough assignment to do, and you need to sort of build up some sort of rapport with the people you're working with with the charity you're working with, with the ground staff when you get there. Um, you, your need is to get as many strong images as possible, but you'll need, you have to be careful. You have to be able to understand the situation before moving in too quickly to take any pictures. So you introduce yourself, you talk, you, start, you talk, and you, um, you try and establish a sort of a relationship with everybody there. And then, you know, you, you tentatively take, start taking some pictures and then, you know, that's how you work. That, I mean, the first time I went into these situations, it was quite tricky, but uh, after a while, if you keep going back to these situations, you know how, to, how it works and how to sort of like operate in these situations, which can be quite tricky. Um, this assignment was in, uh, this is in the Mississippi Delta. Um, I, I've been I've been to America more times than I can remember, and it was always to do the celebrity side or the glamour side of America. But I always used to see the uh, I always used to notice the, so much poverty in America, and it never got we never got anywhere near that story. And so I came back from one particular trip. And I spoke to my deputy editor. Said, "Listen, I want to go into I want to go to America to do a um, a long term project on on poverty in America." And so we sat down and discussed it. And we had an American correspondent in New York. And once we finalised the trip, I um, we decided on 
um, visiting eight the eight poorest states in America, from Detroit to Chicago to um, Mississippi Delta, down somewhere in southern some uh, Mississippi. I can't remember the eight states now, but we also included Washington and New York in these states as well. I went to um, uh, Oak, Oklahoma, sorry, um, South South Dakota or North Dakota. Uh, one of the poorest states in the country at the time and went to Washington because it was the murder capital of the, of America at the time as well. So that included included Washington in the, the project as well. And it was a fascinating trip to go around these uh, different states and um, learning more about uh, the situation in America. I mean, if you're on the bread line in America, it's uh, it's a tough, tough life. And... Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't think it's, it's. I don't know if it's comparable with with the UK. But you know, I mean, if you're in a poverty line in the UK, poverty line in, in America. I mean, it's all relevant. But I just feel it's so much harder in America um, without any sort of insurances or national health or anything. It's just. It's just. And so that was reason for going over to America to do this, do this this story in uh, in America. And this woman in the Mississippi Delta. Um, didn't understand me her my accent and her accent were completely at odds <laughs> and so she pulled out this pistol and pointed at me and I, I just took a I think it was a reflex action just taking a picture with my camera or maybe use it as a shield actually but I fired off two frames and got this laughing uh, shopkeeper pointed the gun at me and uh, and we got on like a house on fire after that but um, it was a bit of a shock to have a gun pointed at you um, this was in um, Afghanistan, and this was at the um, the military base Kandahar. Um, when I first went to Kandahar, it was a small military base with the only only the Americans and the Brits there. And then on this trip, it had grown exponentially. It was massive. I like, had so many different countries there, and these were Turkish Turkish labourers building. Uh, different sites for different uh, members of NATO, basically, I think. Um, and they worked through the night until they took, and they, these finishes, they, these were finished within a couple of days, these new sites. Uh, and the airport grew to such, such a massive scale. Um, accommodated many of the, um, um, the allied forces there, basically, fighting the Taliban. And I love this picture. I mean, I walked past and just, you know, you couldn't stop, you couldn't fail to take a picture. Uh, while I was there, I was embedded with the soldiers, the U.S. Army, and I got I got a bit bored throwing off in the soldiers with the guns and the usual stuff. And uh, and and this battalion I got friendly with played uh, were playing touch football, and so I just joined in. I actually joined in on one of the sides, and I took my camera, uh, one angle lens, and took pictures while I was chasing the, the soldiers around. And I got some great images from this. Uh, from this, uh, the day off for these soldiers basically because these and they play with the intensity of uh fighting with the Taliban, same the same intensity as fighting the Taliban. They were it was 100 degrees there, and they were throwing this ball around at breakneck speed. I'm trying to keep up, trying to take pictures, wiping the sweat from my eyes, and uh, oh, yeah, I've got some great images, alternative images from the Afghanistan uh, conflict there, uh, and these are. Images working with charities in um, the first one in Thailand, in Bangkok, well, with the AIDS pandemic, when that was uh, at a certain height. We did a lot of work around there in South Africa and, uh, and Thailand and Asia. And this was a hospice in, ba in Bangkok with an Irish, um, Irish uh, priest uh, who looked after the hospice there. Uh, it was really challenging. That was it was quite heavy. That place. Um, it was the last, it, the last rites he gave to the, the people in those in his hospice. And the second picture on the right is a school, is a classroom being filled with children. I was trying to get out actually this uh, out of this room. There were so many kids in this room. It was really hard to breathe, and it was stiflingly hot. This is in Rwanda, 
and, uh, and they all wanted the desk and the pen and to sit down. This is new schools re being rebuilt after the genocide of ten, um, 10 years after the genocide. So we, with the help of the Daily Mirror and Oxfam, we rebuilt uh, uh, a couple of the villages up in the mountains, mountainous area of Rwanda, and we built a new school. So every kid was eager to learn and speak English and um, and to write. So it was a it was a fascinating trip as well. Fantastic trip that was. I spent about six months in Rwanda on that trip. Um, and this was in Baghdad just before the second invasion. Um, just before, yes, just before the second invasion. We were called over to, we were invited over to Afghanistan, uh, sorry, Iraq by Tariq Aziz, who was Hussein's number two. Um, um, and so we had a tour of Iraq and basically saying, look, we have no mass, we have no weapons of mass destruction here. You're quite welcome to visit all our sites. Um, I do what you want. You can come and you can visit all our, everything you want to do. And even we even tried to get a, an interview with Saddam Hussein as well, which we nearly, nearly achieved, but uh, in the end, we didn't get it. We spoke to Tariq Aziz in the end. But this picture, I was walking through uh, Baghdad, saw these guys putting up this latest poster of Saddam, and I just thought, wow, wonderful picture. And I took it and immediately got arrested, taken off by soldiers. And um, uh, <laughs> I, I eventually got, got released, but uh, it was quite scary at one point, actually. So, but it, I, I, still, I still like this picture. It's an amazing picture. This is back in uh, Kandahar with the American soldiers playing touch football. This is uh, Hurricane Katrina. It's in um, New Orleans. Um, that was, it was, it was almost apocalyptic, that was. There's so many people um, uh, desperate in, in desperate needs, nowhere to live, nowhere to stay, uh, no medicine, no food. It was just unbelievable, unbelievable. This is one of the um, sports arenas that uh, were occupied by the thousands of uh, um, residents from New Orleans and the, around and surrounding areas. And so many kids were missing. So many kids were missed, were misplaced and separated from their parents. It was, it was, um, it was a tough, tough situation. Tough situation. Um, this was another, this was also part of Hurricane Katrina, and this was a more affluent area. A young couple, um, been married about six months, and they lived in a very plush area of, uh, just outside New Orleans, and you can see the size of the houses behind, and they're standing on their plot. Their house was completely blown away. Um, uh, we interviewed them and we spoke to them and talked to them. And um, yes, it was a uh, very sad, very sad sight. And the picture on the right, on the right, is from the Bali bombing. There's another job where I was given an hour to get to Heathrow Airport, get on the last flight to um, Indonesia. The bomb had gone off, and you know, you land there, you land in Indonesia in Bali. Um, I think we landed about 10 hours after the bomb had gone off. So it was still smoking while we got there. Um, and you work straight away. You just, you know, no hotels, no, you just get a taxi to the, to the area and you start taking pictures. And we worked all through the night and sending images over via, in those days, via my mobile phone and my um, Apple laptop. Um, so you sent, or straight from the camera, really. I can't, I can't remember how I did it, but this was a, a makeshift morgue uh, at the bomb site in Bali. That was a quite, that was a, that was a shocking site that was as well. This was back in uh, Iraq. This is, um, uh, this young fellow had lost his family in the first, in the first, um, in the first battle of, the, of uh, Iraq, first Gulf War, sorry. And his family were in a bunker deep down in um, 
the suburbs of Iraq, but one of the American bombs penetrated the bunker and killed many women and children, including his wife and his whole family. And so we were shown the bomb damage and, um, you know, we thought, so we, I photographed this guy underneath the where the bomb had hit and uh, we came to rape, lay, lay some, um, he was there to lay some, uh, rape, some flowers. Um, during my, um, during my time at the Mirror, I spent um, five years working on the showbiz desk. So it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a top to turvy, but maybe I should have shown this first, because when I first came to the Mirror, I was offered a job by Piers Morgan. He was the editor of the paper at the moment, at the time. And he was a great editor, Piers. He's somewhat changed the way he, um, <laughs> he operates now. But as a newspaper editor, he was a fantastic editor. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew how to get a story. He knew, he just, he just had a really inkling for great stories. And he wanted me to be uh, the showbiz editor for the uh, showbiz photographer for the Daily Mirror, which is a fantastic role. I went around the world photographing parties and junkets and um, first nights of uh, theatres and rock stars, um, rock shows from U2, Stones, Madonna, Michael Jackson, you name it. We did every single major rock star and pop star for seven years, I think, six, seven years. I worked alongside Matthew Wright. He was, uh, it was his page and um, he's a TV journalist, Matthew Wright. Um, and yeah, I mean, these are some of the images that um, I took from my time during the nineties. Remember the nineties, it was during the nineties when it was the Britpop area and it was a fantastic area, a fantastic era. Um, everything was live and buzzy and everything you've seen happen in London and New York. So you're back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And also we're in competition with the sun and their pop page as well. So it, it was constant on the go, on the go. It was Every day was a new day. Uh, this is one of my favourite pictures of Pele having his feet measured for a new soccer boot in Zurich. Um, I love this picture. You know, just the, the intensity of the two guys looking at Pele's Pele's foot, um, um, amazing. I love this picture. Um, this is Sharon Osborne. Uh, I spent a couple of weeks with the Osbournes when they're in their Hollywood um, mansion, working doing the Channel Four Osborne program. So uh, I think Sharon was writing a book, and we serialized the book. So I spent two weeks with the family. Um, in Hollywood, and myself and a reporter, and we photographed Ozzy and Sharon and the two kids as well uh, during the two weeks, and, and it was that was a real eye opener, um, following them around and and staying in Beverly Hills for a couple of weeks as well. Uh, it was a great shoot, and they were really accommodating. Sharon and Ozzy were were lovely. They were very eccentric, but they were absolutely lovely. So it was a great great shoot to be working on. Um, so part of my tour with working with the showbiz was to do album releases, record releases, um, you name it, basically, concert releases. So Beyonce was doing a, was coming to UK to do a tour. So I went over to Dallas to photograph Destiny's Child and Beyonce. I met, I've met Beyonce a few times, actually, during this, my time there. So doing the showbiz. And they were so much, they were so professional, the Americans. They were so good. Anything you wanted to do, they tried to do it and tried to help you. Um, and they always got great pictures with uh, with many of the American stars. Um, on the right, this is Michael Jackson. I I spent. I was told to come to go to Harrods and photograph a very special um, celebrity, but they wouldn't tell me who he was. I didn't know who he was. So I went three or four hours in this room in Harrods. Um, it was Al Fayed's, the then owner of Harrod, Harrods. It was his special guest. And I had a little mini studio um, fixed up in one of the suites at the top of Harrods. Um, and 
I, I went along with my journalist, waited about, well, it must have been about five hours, a copious amount of tea and biscuits, waiting for this so-called celeb to come through and for me to photograph them. And I didn't have a clue who it was. I thought it might be Robbie Williams or Take That or, I, I don't know, somebody somebody like that. And then Michael Jackson came through the door. That was really a real surreal time. And um, we shook hands and had a cup of tea and... Um, and we had a good chat and he just come back from Ireland. I come from Ireland, he was house hunting, he said, uh, and he'd been downstairs shopping and he apologised for being so long because he got carried away in, in Harrods. And then he, um, and we just sat for my, for me for my pictures and we took some pictures and I, I took this frame as an aftershot actually, after he got up and um, Alfred was fussing around. He said, oh, no, give Michael some space, give him some space. And I knew I didn't have enough images for, for Michael Jackson. So I, um, so when he got up, I just took a, two more frames and I got two, two similar frames to this one. And I entered it for the Taylor Wesson and it got into the, um, it got into the exhibition, which was um, nice, to, nice to see. Um, this was David Bowie and John Bon Jovi. I went to New York, New Jersey to photograph John Bon Jovi. And it was one of those times, really frustrating shoots when you were told by the PRs and the managers, do not talk to John unless he talks to you. Do not direct John unless he talks to you. And so I go in there and break all the rules. I start talking to John, I start doing this, I start telling him what, where I've been. And he's, he's talking back to me and I can see the PRs next to me fuming. And and I'm and I'm not happy with the pictures, and and so I walk away halfway through the shoot because what they give me was 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 actually rubbish. I didn't wasn't any good. I walked past a separate room and found this found this spare room, empty room. So when I finished my shoot and when the next photographer finished his shoot, I I um, um, approached John again and said, John, look up, would you please come into this room so I can take a few more shots of you. And the PR would say, no, 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 we haven't got time, we haven't got time, we haven't got time, you've had your, had your allotted 20 minutes, or it was, 10 minutes. And John said, no, 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 that's fine, that's fine. So we came in and did, did an, I had a reshoot with John and it was perfect. So he was a lovely guy. And was, um, I really appreciated his help for that shoot because it was going nowhere when I first started photographing him. And the second shoot was with David Bowie, as you can see. Um, I photographed Bowie a few, on a few occasions and he was always the hardest person I've ever had to photograph. I don't know why he looks a million dollars there as well. It looks really easy, and but he made it so difficult for me to photograph him. And I don't know why I photographed him in Paris and in London a few times, and it was always tricky, always tricky. I never really got a great image of Bowie, which I always wanted, I always regretted actually. And this is the best image I got of Bowie, which um, um, you know, well, it, it, I, I love it. I love the image because it actually means more to me getting this shot than anything else. Um, with Bowie, yes, um, it took a lot persuading David to do a lot of things, or even the simplest thing actually to do. So um, anyway, it was uh, it was it was an honour to meet him, one of my heroes. But they always say you never meet your heroes, don't they? It was um, it wasn't a cracked out. Well, it wasn't it wasn't um, it didn't end up the way I wanted it to be. So, but it was still amazing to meet him and shake his hand and you know take his photograph. I think uh, at that point, John, we might we're going to change directions a bit. Mm -hmm. John, have you got any questions that we could put at the moment? Yes. Um, quite interesting, really. Um, the point about taking photos in places where the the powers that be don't like you taking photographs. So in Iraq, you know, it was amazing. You actually got to keep that image of mm. Saddam on his telephone on the side of the wall. Mm. Pretty, a pretty innocuous image, really, isn't it? It's a bit strange to get arrested for, for taking that. Um, what, what were you allowed to shoot when you were there? You had to, have, you had to be um, accompanied by a government minister. And myself and Chris, uh, the reporter, we just... It was so busy in Baghdad at the time, you know, you walk around, you can you can quite easily get lost from people, you know. And I just happened to walk past, saw, saw these two guys putting the poster up. Chris was talking to the our guide, so I hung back a little bit and then started taking these pictures. I only got two frames. 
but a soldier saw me and came up to me and pushed me into a wall and <laughs> started looking for Chris and the, my interpreter, and my um, guide. And luckily they heard me and came back and um, the soldiers wanted to take me off. But uh, Ali, my our guide, it was quite high up in the, in, in the Iraqi um, government, you know, smoothed it all out basically. And um, I still had the images, which was really great. So, but sometimes, you know, you see something, you've got to take it. You've got to take a picture. I mean, I didn't think I was going to get, I never thought I was ever going to get arrested or shot, but, you know, um, it's happened a few times in, in Afghanistan as well and in Israel and somewhere else. I got, um, I I got threatened and harassed. I got and arrested as well in, in Czechoslovakia as well. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. When you're a bit younger and you're a bit gun ho and you see these images, you, you've got to take them, you know. I, re- I would have regretted it, not taking it anyway, so... And I regret a lot. I regret a lot of pictures I didn't take that I saw so, over the years. Yes, I guess we must all do that eventually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the the program, the the pictures, and the images are, um, about when when you were with the the food program in in Africa, in East Africa. That that's yeah. the you know awful, uh, difficult place, difficult environment. Yeah. Have things improved for the folk that you pictured? You know, you said you went back a few times. Have you been able to see improvements in, in the way that is, um, you know, things are going? And, and do you think that the photography really contributed to that? It contributes the way that you're telling the story. You're giving people the opportunity to see what's going on out there. So these these charities and these, they rely on donations to dig dig for water. They have these massive operations they dig water in the desert. And they have these stations out there in the middle of nowhere that's, medical stations that supply the local tribes, the local um, um, people with medical care and attention. Uh, so, you know, we build up a story or a narrative for the, for the charity in conjunction with the newspaper. So our readers read the stories, see these pictures, and they contribute to the... Uh, to the work, to the running of these um, medical centres, schools, whatever it may be in these um, far-flung places. Um, it is amazing how these places survive, you know. You, you, you can drive for miles and miles and miles and then you see um, a brick building which acts as a school, a medical centre, uh, and anything else, community centre as well, in the middle of nowhere. But it's these, these places are vital for the local people. Here. So and they're funded by international aid agencies and and local and local aid agencies as well. But you know, places like Darfur, we went to as well. That was, you know, they, these places are they're not going to be funded by anybody locally. You know, the money comes from international donations and well wishes and, and charities, NGOs. So I mean, there's a case to say that we we may not do any good for these centres out there, but I, I believe we do, we do, we do. Yeah, sure you do, it's really good. Yeah. I, I was giggling a little bit with the, the John Bon Jovi image, and, and, and you're saying how difficult and un, unapproachable this allegedly was. I met him, I think I was 18. It was in his very first, his band's very first tour of the UK, in a very small club in Newcastle, and how approachable they were. Yes, we were having a drink with the band at the bar. That mm. easy. Mm. Very easy. But anyway, Bowie, um, being difficult to shoot. So so what did you do to persuade him to get that really good picture? <laughs> well, no, I, there was a better picture, because I had this... We were in this hotel room in, uh, in London somewhere, um, and the room was cluttered, he had my my editor, the journalist, had it had Bowie's um, PR team, and he had some other people there. So the room was quite cluttered, and uh, I just saw one of the bedrooms. The edge of the bedroom had some light shining through the window. Had some light shining onto the edge of the bed through the window, and I and it just spotlighted the edge of the bed. I said to David, "Hi, David. I've got two shots. This is the one of them here." We're going to sit you on the corner of the bed with the sun coming through the light. And 
bear in mind, I've only got five minutes, and my and um, Bowie's PR man, who, who I know really well at the time, I still run him really well, Alan Edwards. Um, he says, John, you've got five minutes, so you've got, got, to get, got to get a move on. So I said to them, David, can we just do this picture here? And David went, oh, I don't think so. Do you? <laughs> so I'm like, oh, oh, right, okay. And Alan went, you've got two minutes, John. <laughs> and I was thinking, what else can I do? So I stood Bowie up against the door frame and, um, and took that picture. I got three frames of that picture. And I said to them after that shot, and Alan went, well done, John, thank you. And I said, I walked away and I turned around and said, Alan, actually, I need a couple of more pictures. And Alan was looking really nervous now at me for saying that. And, and, and Bowie was like, okay, okay, let's do it. Let's do some more. So he went over to the corner of the room and I sat him on his sofa and did a couple of shots of him just sitting in a chair, which weren't, which wasn't very remarkable shots. I still got those somewhere as well, but I don't show those pictures because they don't, they're not really remarkable at all. And um, it was all a massive rush and, you know, it was, it's quite nerve wracking, actually. So you got the whole room looking at you. You got Bowie being really, really difficult, and you got to get a great shot for the sort of page of the newspaper or page three of the newspaper next day. So you know it's quite tricky. And you know, if you come back with rubbish, you know you think, oh, what? Well, you know, you need a stock picture. The paper uses a stock picture from the library or somebody else's picture. So you don't want that. You want them to use your picture and with your name underneath it. So you know. So a little pride goes into it as well. You want to get as great, the better shot as you, the best shot you possibly can. And after a while, I mean, I didn't, I mean, I was, it, it didn't phase me, people meeting Bowie or Madonna or Michael Jackson or Prince or Beyonce, you know, I just, like everybody else, you just go up to them and start talking to them and just be nice to them and usually you get your own way. But only Madonna and, um, Madonna and um, Bowie and somebody else as well. Uh, Prince, Prince is quite tricky as well. He was really tricky. <laughs> he was really tricky. Yeah, but normally they um, they're pretty accommodating. So, do you think um, your your MA from the University of Suffolk has changed uh, how you see and how you make your images over time? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure actually. It's it's. It's a different different world, really, and it, which is why which is why I did the MA in the first place because it was completely different to what I was doing um, from the press game. I had twenty five years of working in editorial um, editorial uh, markets, and it got to me in the end. I couldn't do it in the end. I wanted to do my own thing. Yes, so when I started doing the MA, I knew I knew I wanted to do something different. That's right. So. I'd long wanted to do my own personal stories, go out there and do... I'm a photojournalist by heart, so I wanted to go out and find my own stories and do my own stories. While I was working at The Mirror, it was a 24-7 job. It was a great job, you know, and getting paid getting paid well to go around the world to sort of photograph those most amazing sights and people and, and um, experiences. And But I still... At the end of it, I was so keen to leave. That I just took redundancy and um, and left and went off and did my own personal stories. One of my personal stories I found 25 years before I actually did it. Um, and that was working in America, New York, and found the story. And I couldn't get, to, couldn't do it because I was working for the Mirror for so long. It was not, not 25 years, sorry. It was um, uh, nearly 18 years. Sorry, 18 years, yeah. A lifetime. Hmm. Well, I, think actually that's a really, I think that's a good time to move on to the next uh, stage in your your photographic life, John. Mm -hmm. uh, this this is a very striking image. Um, mm. Can you tell us a bit more about this and the, the other charities you've been working with? Yeah, well, I've worked for a number of charities over the years. I still work with quite a few now. And this charity saw my work and called me up to say they want to do a new campaign to try and attract new donors to their leukemia um, campaigns. And they gave me these ideas of, um, of photographing the sick um, and the sufferers in a hospital bed, you know, quite strong portraits in a hospital 
and I'd we'd seen this so many times. I thought, no, I mean, we, you know, these don't really hit home. These images, we've seen them too often. And there's a sort of, you know, you, you get a sort of inertia. You know, this sort of the word you get. So I um, fatigued. You know, when you see these pictures, you see them again and again and again. So they said, okay, well, maybe you come up with an idea. So I, I, um, I had this idea in my head a while actually, and um, I got a art director to draw my ideas and put it down on paper so they could see what, what I was trying to get at. So to, it had to be hard hitting. It had to hit home, and you know what's what's one of the worst things that could ever happen to a a couple with children and that's losing one of them so the whole the whole premise was around losing your child to leukemia so we sort of drum up support that way basically so all these people here are actors and um it was a, it was a two-day shoot in a cemetery in croydon and it it was a really strong powerful campaign which worked for the, the company uh the charity and they um you know it, it worked for their purposes basically and it I mean, you see it rained this is proper rain it rained on cue as well on the shot so, so it worked well yeah so. and and then i get i still get commissioned by magazines around the world actually this was a magazine in singapore wanted me to photograph chaka romana and in in westminster you know nice guy you know ambitious young guy so he was keen to you know be photographed not a problem there this is what i do bread and butter work this is yeah um, and this this was one of the new portcullis house in westminster they have uh, an art collection there and i was commissioned by I don't know, I can't remember who it was, it was the curator of um, Port Cullet's House or the Westminster uh, House, of, House, of Lord, House of Commons, House of Lords, I think it was. And um, I was to photograph Tony Blair's first female cab cabinet. Um, so all these all these ladies here were, were members of his cabinet. Uh, I think he had, he had uh, was one missing here that was... Um, uh, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland MP. Um, Mo Molan. Mo Molan, yes. She, she died before this picture was taken. So I spent uh, a couple of days researching um, the area in Westminster and it took a long time actually to get these women together in one place. So, you know, a good four hour pre pre preparation for a 20 minute shoot, basically. So, and which worked quite well, and it's still hanging in the somewhere in Port Cullis now, house now. So, so my job now, as I said, is advertising and commercial, so the and and corporate as well. So this shot on the left is a is an MD and the CEO of a big big law firm in the, in the in London, and and they come to me because they they came to me because they said they wanted something different. They didn't want anything too traditional, too stage. And so I just, I go out there and shoot completely my way, basically shoot into the sun. Um, I don't know, shoot a bit left field. And if I cock it up, I cock it up actually. I mean, I'm, I'm never going to cock everything up. I'm always going to get a couple of frames, but I really push the boat out and, you know, shoot um, in a way that may get something a bit different and I, uh, I invariably do and they they're very really pleased with the result and this this really big company they were talking about uh, a big merger with another company um uh, or a big buyer actually so it was, it was all hush hush and embargoed for, for weeks as well and the picture on the right was an equestrian center so which is like i do sort of like uh, company branding so this was a branding shoot for an equestrian centre in Suffolk. Um, so, yeah, it was quite straightforward. It was a nice shoot. You know, using high quality... Yeah. Using, I always find using high quality cameras, um, especially for the corporate work, and especially for the commercial work, it, it stands out so much. So using, using Hasselblad's at the 100 gigs, 100 
so it's 100 gigs or 50 50 to 100 yeah the quality is so so much better um it stands out and people notice this and you, you my clients notice this as well so um uh i can't um speak highly enough for the Hasselblad cameras uh, same thing here with um corporate branding um they want something bit they want something new they they still wanted the traditional headshot there but which is still a, di a bit different to normally what I, what they what they used to use um so you know i do location and inside and try and give them a, var a variety of different images this is for a law firm again big law firm in london and um, this is for this, this was a campaign for lambeth schools uh, working through different um, secondary schools in Lambeth, uh, trying to bring a documentary style to their campaigns and um, the, the images. Uh, yeah, these random shots. Um, I get called for... Well, I worked for the Suffolk Wildlife Trust, which is on the left here. I've been working with them for 10 years now, which is a fantastic um client to have i love working for the in the, the, the 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 trust out in the countryside um i do everything for them from tree hugging to to tree felling really and insects vertebrae the whole lot i've done the whole lot and i am they said they've got when they approached me they said we've got hundreds of wildlife photographers but we've got nobody who can take pictures of people and that's where i come in i specialize in photographing people i haven't got the patience to sit and photograph birds i just haven't got it or insects or butterflies or dragonflies um but i will photograph people in in the environment of countries in the countryside and it's one wonderful i love it uh, one, of, one of my great clients i'm still working for them next week actually for it's been 10 and a half years now yeah, so it's been great and the picture on the right is uh, another branding shoot for a um uh She's a singer for a, a, a local singer, a quite well known band in Suffolk. Yeah, this picture should have been with the other picture on the funeral. There's, this goes back to the leukemia shoot as well. Mm. This is supposed to be um, a sister losing a sibling. Yeah, so, so we did a series of these, we did a series of six different scenarios, all really, really powerful. And she's an actress as well, so you know. So I have to direct her in a certain way to try and give her time, let her feel the emotion, and bring the emotion up, and try and get the images, especially shooting through glass as well. You know, we had to get the, everything right, and you know, it worked perfectly. Though it's a great shoot. And this again was in the Horn of Africa, in working with the charities on the left hand side. It's Takana tribe. And on the right is a, a still taken from my Black Britannia project in 2007, eight. Uh, it was, he was the first black guardsman to guard the queen. And he'd come from, originally from, from Kenya. And he's, he always wanted to be a soldier, a, a, a scarlet soldier, he told me. Um, for when he grew up in um, Kenya watching um, the Trooping of the Colour, and he was fascinated by it. And um, he went, eventually got there. He be, became, he guarded the Queen of Buckingham Palace. I'm not sure if he did the, did the Trooping of the Colour, but um, things didn't turn out too well for him anyway, so he had to be, he had to leave the army through pressure of, um, a lot of bullying went on in there, so he had to eventually leave the army, unfortunately. This was another mad shoot I did with Save the Children. Uh, I think it was a hundred babies. I can't remember the whole catch line now. I can't remember if it was a breastfeeding or, or I, I can't remember now. Time running out, I can't remember. But it was a, it was a really difficult shoot, as you can imagine. Because not only have we got a hundred babies there, we have a hundred mothers in the corner, all just dying to dive in and pick up their child. And which they did, 
<laughs> and it didn't really work. Um, it this is the best shot we got from the um, whole ten hour shoot. Well, well the five hours it seemed like ten hours at a time. Um, we kept we had about four hundred babies over the, over the space of the time in Hoban Studios in London, with the bigger studio, and we just uh, kept on swapping babies over to try and get the right picture. I don't think it was used in the end, but um, it was a, certainly was an experience anyway working on a shoot like this. These are portraits. If I had to do one thing, it'd be portraits. I love portraiture and I love photographing people and lifestyle shots. I, I, I think I've got a knack for photographing people and making them look genuine, making them look authentic. And uh, this picture is my son actually on the left. This is in, in America. It just happens to snap. The first picture I took with a, with a Fuji um x pro one the first couple of frames the first shot anyway the first proper picture and uh i got a great shot of my son and the picture on the right is a commission for the sunday times um ipswich ladies football play football team i just saw this player and i just got her to stop and i took a picture of her and that's that's in the current um bjp Portrait manual, uh, one of the portrait books now. I think it's Portrait of Britain. Yeah, that's right. It's in Portrait of Britain. That shot there. Yes, so I love my portraits. Yeah, so I do a lot of portraits for commercial and um, for corporate clients as well. Yeah, so this shot on the left is Google and a Google executive, which this shot led me on to loads of work as well with them because um, they love this shot. Uh, everything seemed to everything seemed to work at the right time the light came through the colors the everything it was just beautiful so um, uh, yes it was a good shot and then this is one of my shots for the Soviet Wildlife Trust so I produce all these images portrait images of all their volunteers their staff their workers the um, everybody that comes through the you know, 55 sites in Suffolk so I go around to all the I've been around to all the sites now and photograph their workers, their volunteers, um, every single new program they have, children, uh, old, age, old, age, old age pensioners, everything. Um, I love it. Um, it's a great, great shoot, great um, job. Um, yeah, this was a, I, li I live in, in sunny Suffolk. So this was uh, on one of the beaches in Suffolk. We have a kite competitions at um, surf, Kite surfing. So this is Holly. She's a champion kite surfer, and so I, I love photographing um, the beaches out there in the Suffolk in the summer, especially in the summer. And the next shot is in latitude um, in Suffolk as well. And these two are in Suffolk too. These are uh, one's a branding shoot for a nutritionist on the left, um, and the second I work I work for a, a large country country veterinary practice as well um i've been doing their work for two or three years now and i love doing that They've, it's a really big practice as well so and you get some great quirky pictures from uh, the vets if you you know just stand around and or sit around and wait until something happens and you get you know called into like can i come in they always like yeah come in come in come in you get these great shots you know and this was a commission for triplets um which is really tricky to do actually but um lovely you know stuff has got lovely locations so you know it wasn't that difficult to find a location it was a nice shot and these are more branding shots in suffolk again um he's a restaurateur vernon he owns a few restaurants he wanted some pictures for his uh um for his branding websites and commercial promotions and uh, one of his shots in his in, this is in, inside one of his restaurants in woodbridge in suffolk um i went to i went to sudan i went to sudan with oxfam for two years two for two years in a row the first time when sudan when south sudan split for north sudan so we did the, the, the world's newest country 
and which was a fascinating trip as well. Um, really, really strong trip, really good trip. Um, I'm going to say about it, but this, I mean, this image was, was the second year, actually. So we went back a, a, a year later to see how the country had progressed, the world's newest country and how it had um, moved on and to see if it was progression. And it wasn't really progression. It's was, you know, it a sad a sad story really it's still in conflict with the north with the north and um this was a refugee camp uh and on the border of north sudan and south sudan the top picture is actually is from the first year is from the parade um in um, juba in southern sudan and these guys are standing out there for hours <laughs> in heat so going back to the first picture this the next the, the first slide or the sort of previous slide, I took a picture of this young boy on, at the refu refugee centre and Oxfam used it for their post, as you can see, and the Independent used it for their front cover of the uh, magazine as well. And this was Oxfam in Miranda. This woman had been... Um, she had been um, rejected by different clans, different um, tribes in her village. And because of the reconciliation program they had in Miranda, she was she was eventually allowed back into the village setup, her and her, her small community. And this was an image just to promote, try and promote the reconciliation program, yes, that's right. It's got used around the world, this picture, this was really... Really powerful picture. Uh, and this is Jana. She's one of the field workers I worked with in South Sudan. This is South Sudan, yes, um, at the refugee centre. This is the father and his three sons. I remember getting seeing this image and thinking, I've seen this image before somewhere. I, or I, I've seen a similar image of a father and his sons, and I tried to replicate this image. And it worked quite well. There's somebody, independent news, this really really well as well. Uh, this is the current shoot I'm doing now. I'm doing a, uh, I've been commissioned to do a series of, um, series of standalone stories on people with gambling addictions. And this guy has had gone through what the charities, one of the charities healing programs um, to help with his gambling addiction. So I spent some time with him in, I was in Belgium. And um, we just had to try and get as many images as possible to try and um, build a story, a narrative around his addiction and his, um, his story. Um, as you can know, this is about um, notes on blindness. This is uh, most of my stories come through curiosity and through my own, you know, wanderlust. Really, you know, you know, you see people who are blind all the time, but how much do we know about about um, living with uh, with uh, living with, with blindness? Not, you know, we don't know much about it at all. I researched this and I met quite a few people, partially sighted people, and um, it's so much harder than you actually think it is. Life is so tough, people are blind. Well, we know that anyway, but actually to hear their own story in their own words, it, it's shocking, it's so hard. So every time I see somebody blind, a blind person, I'm, you know, I'm there, I'm willing to help them if I can. Um, it's... Um, it's a tough affliction to, to live with, really tough. Um, and so I did a, I wrote essays about this. Um, and this was part of my um, my MA actually. I did this in my MA. And, and this this was in the portrait of Britain as well. This shot on the left. Um, I entered. And yeah, so I spent um, six months writing to the Blind Association and meeting blind people and talking to blind people and putting notices in fa on Facebook to meet blind people. And um, I did, and I got some great shots. 
and great stories as well. Uh, two sisters, two sisters went blind together over a space of two, three years. And talking to them about slowly going blind. Like, can, you, can you imagine losing your sight month after month? It gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, just, um, just, it was just hard to hear, hard to listen to. And this young girl on the right as well. Um, she lost her sight when she was um, becoming a teenager. So, you know, that was really, really hard for her. And I photographed one guy who was blind from birth. He says he doesn't want his sight back. He's quite happy living in darkness now because it would be too much of a shock for him if he could see things, he said. Um, this is another project I did with another charity on rural poverty and isolation and loneliness and depression as well. And, it, and where I live out in the countryside, there's... Loads of pretty villages, chocolate box cottages, but they're million miles from nowhere. And people live in isolation and especially the elderly. So, you know, I spoke to them, photographed them and talked to them. And, you know, I and um, went through their problems and and um, stories. And it was an eye opener to me as well about the people living in isolation and loneliness uh, in, in isolation sorry um it made interesting pictures as well so yeah, and interesting stories and same as this one I, I was interested in people with albinism i don't i know nothing about albinism i know people i don't know anybody with albinism and so i i i met somebody at a bus stop that's how i got into this story actually I started talking to him and I just wanted to say more. So I started to talk to people with, uh, with albinism. I spent three years working on this project and the Sunday Times ran it. Um, they ran five pages of it, actually. And uh, it was a great, great, great feature um, and an interesting story, interesting subject. And subsequently, one from the Sunday Times feature, I got more work with the Sunday Times working with them, which was great. These are just different stories up, up and down the country. I went all around the country and to Ireland as well, all over the UK, uh, meeting people with albinism. There's some shocking stories to tell as well, actually. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I love this project. It's great. I, it's great images, really, from this project. And as if you can read the caption there, in where I live, there's a um, uh, there's a stadium for um, banger racing and stock cars and speedways, a speedway centre. But they have banger races there, and and then they're fairly big banger racing um, competitions. So I went there one day and just said, "Can I come in and take some pictures?" And I was so surprised at the level of <laughs> professionalism and camaraderie community and what well, great fun as well you know and there's some real characters who, who uh, work within this industry and um you know live and breathe this industry and uh, they're all characters they've all got some funny stories and they're all this is their life they love it love what they do you know and they go around the country on banger race and um i wish i could spend some more time with them you know on this job um, i wanted to do a book but i just haven't got the time and uh, I love this shot. It's one of my favourite shots. And I said, you know, it was this was in the mid middle of the winter, mud everywhere, and it's great, it's great characters, great characters. And all these personal stories are right on your doorstep, so you don't have to travel miles to them. You just have to go and find them. You know, you know, this is two miles from where I live. And uh, this is going back to one of my. First personal project. This is um, Black Britannia. I did this when I worked at the Mirror as well um, during my time at the Mirror. I was doing a lot of stories on the um, Black community, and it was all negative, basically. Too many negative stories, and uh, I was getting a bit cheesed off with it all, basically saying, you know, I can't keep going to. It's all about drugs, single mothers, uh, gun crime, knife crime. It, it was all negative press. And I, you know, I've met loads of uh, decent black people, hardworking black people who never get any sort of uh, um, praise or attention. So I went out of my way to find 50 black Britons who had achieved 
major things in their in their careers, like a high court judge. I didn't even know there was a black high court judge. Uh, there's a uh, the guy on the left, Johnny. He was top stylist, uh, international stylist for celebrities around the world. Um, so I and um, Baroness Amos, she was the she was uh, UN number two at the UN, and she was a, she was ambassador to Australia. Um, so I photographed these people who had who had not get it, hadn't gotten any sort of a notoriety. So, and, and it got me a lot of tension. Um, as I said, Downing Street heard about my project and Gordon Brown came along and wanted to take part and open the, um, openly, openly launch my project, which was fantastic. This was the project I saw when I first saw, when I first went to America, not first went to America, when I went to America for another cheesy story I did in New York many, many years ago. And I saw these black cowboys parading through Times Square when I was in my hotel room, looked out the window, saw these cowboys parading through the streets as part of another, a big, bigger parade. And I thought, why are they dressed up as cowboys? You know, I never see black guys dressed up as cowboys. You never see cowboys as black cowboys. And so, and then the news came on later on the day and uh, they, they interviewed these black cowboys. So I phoned them up. They were in Queens. I phoned them up and said, you know, you know, I want to know more about you. And they said, we're, we're just, they were paying homage to the real black cowboys. Did you know they were the first cowboys? So that really sparked my uh, curiosity. And I said, right, I want to find out more about black cowboys. But this took me 18 years before I could actually go down to America Go to go down to southern states of America and photograph these the black cowboy community, which there are thousands of them, and um, and no one knows about them. It was just so weird. I walked walked into this arena, rodeo arena, about twenty thousand black cowboys, there, and I'm thinking with my colleague, why does anybody know about this? You know, this is I shot this 10, 12 years ago now, and since then, you know, since because of this project they've got more and more notoriety and some of the people from this project have got their own tv shows they're on films they're extras uh they're on reality tv because of my work on this project uh, so it got a lot got me a lot of notoriety not only in the uk but in in america as well more and more so in america because it was it was new to americans as well uh, i loved it. i spent two trips two eight-week trips traveling around six different states in america so I went eight weeks, first trip, came back, got some more money together, kissed a wife, I said, I'm going back again. And I went back and did some more. And it was, uh, it was fantastic. It was a trip of a lifetime. And that's precisely why I left the mirror to do these sort of stories, to do my personal stories. And and, and, and the Sunday Times used this story as well, um, along with my Abino story. The Sunday Times used this cowboy story. And then I worked for them doing other stories as well. So it was... Um, it was a great time, great time. Um, and this is my last project, which um, I got commissioned. I think commission, I got approached to do this project in Suffolk and I didn't know what to do. And um, so I did it on Black Suffolk. And then in where I live in, um, in Suffolk, there is a, a small black community which came here during the 60s to work. And um, so I centered the project around the black community and what it was like to live and work in a basically agricultural rural county. And, um, you know, how did they get on and how did they find it living and growing up here? Um, and it, uh, it did very well. It, uh, the, my, the local museum are in, I'm in negotiation with the local museum now to, to buy the whole collection, which is great. And um, the Guardian used it really well as well. They used it as featured in their paper and then online. And um, and they've got some great stories. You know, these guys came here in the sixties and fifties. You know, it was wonderful stories. You know, and it was it was hard for them as well. Uh, this girl grew up in a little village, and only black girl in the village, and she learned how to dance. And you know, so took them back to her village in somewhere in Suffolk. Um, yeah, it worked really well. And this is my my attempt at doing, being my own publisher. I've got thousands and thousands of images that I've shot over the years, 
and they're all sitting on hard drives. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do with them? I don't want to just leave them there. It's this legacy thing I have, or this heritage, I don't know, heritage, legacy thing that, you know, what nobody else wants these pictures, you know, it's going to throw them away. If I, if I, if I snuff it tomorrow, you know, they'd be, be in the bin probably, wouldn't they? So I thought maybe get my hard drives out, dig them all out and find my old images and do my own magazine. So I hired a graphic designer in turn and I got a VA now and a, PR girl now and, and also social media person now as well and we put together a magazine and I talk about all my stories that I've done over the years which is, and I've got hundreds of stories I could talk about hundreds of pictures that I could put fill the magazines with and I'm on to my fourth edition and I've got I can carry I, could, I can probably do 20 editions easily on stuff I've done over the years but I got some good feedback. I got some good work from it as well. So I want to carry it on. It's hard work. It's labor of love. But it is really hard work, actually, putting it together and writing all the articles. And, um, but yeah, you know, why not? You know, I'm going to show my pictures somehow. Otherwise, they just sit on the hard drives and never get seen. So that's my way of showing the world my pictures. Uh, before, we, before we finish off, thank you very much, John. Um, Sean. Have you got some more questions? We're we're a bit past time, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll just sort of ask some quickly. Um, one about how do you approach the photography of your own stories? I, I think you've given us um, some ideas that perhaps you fall into the subjects. You, you bump into something that interests you. Is, is that fair to say? Well, no, you've got to think about you. You know, there's loads of stories you can I can think of now that I want to photograph. If you want to photograph something, you think about it and then you go and try and do it. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, I just, just loads of stories, especially when it comes to cultural um, stories and ideas, because, you know, there's all, they're, all, they're, they're, people are crying out for you about those stories. So I can, you know, I, um, I don't know. Um, there's a, there's a, oh, I can't remember, there's a story with Afghans in Norfolk um who've got a collective so you know i could do a project around them approach them mm. or i don't know there's, there's so many stories you can go and do and if you've got a if there's a will you can go and do it and put it together and sell it to one of the magazines or somewhere on, there's loads of companies online who will use it as well i mean this is personal projects you know you're not going to get a heap of money out, out of yeah. it but you know i've just sold one of my projects to the museum of Suffolk and of Ipswich and Colchester. And that's quite a good lump sum I negotiate with them. So that has worked in that respect, which is a blessing enough, and, you know, so it does work. It does work. Keep, keep doing personal projects. Keep coming up with ideas that you think are unusual and yeah. something that interests you. And, and, and your magazine here looks, very professional from the covers. Are, are these things that people can buy online or actually in, in some physical? Uh, they're all free. They're all free. You just go, you just go onto my website and you just sign up to them and you get, you download each magazine. Right, so PDF type of publishing. Nice. Yeah, flip. Or I don't know, flip. my, my designer, uh, designs. We, we, we talk about design, we have different pictures. And that's another thing I love doing front covers because we have so many images that, um, work for the front cover that you know and we see you get inspiration from other magazines the, set, the, the middle image we got um inspiration from another magazine in new york um so you know we just i mean it's great i mean it's, why not you know Indeed. i think it looks really cool i'm very um, interested in your uh, uh albino living with albinism uh Mm. project I, when i lived in nigeria for a couple of years we had a, um, a technician in the in one of the labs who was uh, albino and he had a lot of troubles of course because living in tropical africa as we were he um he, he really had, he spent most of his time in inside under cover because if he hadn't he'd have got skin cancer very very quickly yes yeah how uh, many of the people that you dealt with were from from Africa or of African descent because it seemed to be a fair number of Nigerians that that, that have the gene. 
Well, yeah, it was not only Nigerians, just yeah, all over Africa. But these these are all Nigerians living in UK, mm. born in UK. Um, all with the albinism uh, gene, um, Caribbean, Africa, um, Asia as well, a lot of Asians as well. So, but the hardest bit is trying to find them. That's the hardest bit. And then once you found them, to convince them to do uh, the shoot with you. There was one girl that did a shoot with me. She was hiding from her family. She was from Pakistan, actually. And she was on the run from her family, so I couldn't... And she wanted to do it. She wanted to tell her story. But she didn't want her brothers and her father to find out where she was. Otherwise, they'd come and get her and bring her back to the family and have an arranged marriage with her. So, so her story was equally or doubly sh shocking or difficult or, you know, it was, um, you know, just when you never know what you're going to find, you know, if you don't, if you, if you go out there and find these stories and look for these stories and, you know, you come over, you come, people have, people's stories are weird than fiction, you know, uh, it just, um, you have to spend time to find these stories basically. Sure. Uh, well, I've got one more question, which is a sort of technical one, really. Um, mm -hmm. We can see that a lot of the shots, you know, you like to shoot into the sun. Uh, are you using only natural light or are, are you using some flash or, or some other lighting to help? No, and so I use both. I use natural light and I use strobes. Yeah. I mean, I use strobes on location. I've always used strobes on location. So, I mean, since I was training, I... A photographer told you, you know, taught me the benefits of using strobes on location. I always get it gives you that extra punch. For, for me, I find that extra punch, and it also adds a certain vividness to my images. I like vivid colors. I love saturated colors. Um, I just think it brings a vibrancy to the to the image, and it's my signature. I think so. You know, yeah. but funny enough, I'm starting. I'm just starting a fine art studio shoots and they're going to be black and white so um you know we'll see how it goes with that really <laughs> right yeah, yeah you, the style really comes through john really thank you mm. wow uh what do we say thank you is not enough really it was a fascinating uh, hour and a quarter as it turned out but absolutely worth every minute and um just listening to your stories of how you've <clears throat> picked up stories and chased them. I mean, the, as you said, the, the one about the cowboys where you went back twice to to, to make sure you, you'd captured the story. And hmm. those of us who are not uh, uh, professionals, they, they, we have no idea about what you need to do to fund these things. And you've done, you know, you, you have to work hard just to get that. So... Hmm. Absolutely amazing and wonderful series of images and stories. Um, so thanks so much, uh, John, for sharing that. Thank you too to Sean for co-hosting and doing the, the questions. And just a little bit of uh, uh, an invitation. Next month we have Grant Scott and the United Nations of Photography. And that's on Monday the 20th of June at 7. And you can sign up for that. And a number of talks going forward we have them going right through till the end of this year and indeed thinking of your project on albinism john we we've, we've got um, uh, the, um, the the woman who was uh, who took the photograph of the albino uh, girl in london uh, when she does it uh, in underwater uh, portraiture which was oh. uh, quite quite incredible and, and brought out the the essence of the of the subject very so very well, and that'll be later on in the year. So I'll uh, I'll just say thank you very much once again, John, and thank you to everybody for tuning in. This has been recorded, and we will putting it be putting it up in YouTube uh, in the next couple of weeks. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It's been an honour um, and a pleasure. So thank you for asking me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So thank you very much, John. It's very kind of you. That girl, this sounded right, did it? On